In 2010 in Canada, there was an attack on the home of an ordinary Asian family. Despite Canada being a safe country, home invasions happen quite frequently worldwide, and they no longer come as a surprise. However, today's story is different. During the attack on this particular home, the criminals didn't take much money, but they killed the mother and attempted to kill the father. Meanwhile, the surviving daughter managed to call the police. The father remained in a coma for a prolonged period, and when he finally woke up, he provided investigators with profoundly tragic testimony that moved everyone in the courtroom to tears. The daughter's life soon turned into a living hell. Hello everyone, welcome to the Paradox channel. Subscribe to the channel to watch intriguing stories related to crime and incidents. Now, let's begin the video. Today's story takes place in Canada, in a town called Markham. It is located approximately 19 miles northeast of downtown Toronto. The city was named after the first lieutenant governor of Upper Canada, John Graves Simcoe, who served in the 18th century and named the area after his friend William Markham. Markham is not only a significant city in Canada but also a city where various nationalities, including Canadians themselves, reside. Although the term Canadians can have different interpretations, the majority of people in this city generally identify themselves as such. In this city, there are families with both East Asian and European roots. One such family was the Pan family. They were immigrants from the Chinese diaspora in Vietnam who had moved to Canada. The family consisted of the mother, Bich Ha Pan, and the father, Huey Han Pan. They arrived in Canada as refugees. Like Bich, Han was born and educated in Vietnam, and in 1979, he moved to Canada. The couple got married in Toronto and settled in Scarborough. They found employment in the automotive parts manufacturing sector at Magna International, both working as tool and die makers. Han and Bitch were frugal, and by 2004, they were financially stable enough to purchase a house with a two-car garage on a residential street in Mark. Soon, seven years after their move, they welcomed a daughter named Jennifer, and two years later, in 1989, a son named Felix. Jennifer was a daughter who always found herself at the center of her parents' attention, but not in a positive sense of the word. It's worth noting that for Han and Bitch, the main priority in the family was the upbringing of their children. The parents set numerous goals for their children and placed significant expectations on them. Jennifer was enrolled in piano lessons at the age of four, and she also took figure skating lessons, spending most of her days training each week. Initially, Jennifer enjoyed this sport very much, as she diligently aimed to become an Olympic figure skating champion until she suffered a knee ligament injury. According to her school friend Karen Keho, Han was considered a classic tiger dad, and Bitch was his reluctant accomplice. Jennifer attended Mary Ward Catholic Secondary School, where she played the flute in the school orchestra. The Pans picked up Jennifer every day after school and closely monitored her extracurricular activities. They never allowed her to date during high school or attend school dances, fearing that these activities would distract her from her studies. Even after turning 18, she was not allowed to attend any parties. At the age of 22, she had never been to a club, never been drunk, never been to a friend's cottage, and never been on vacation without her family. Her friends viewed such upbringing as restrictive and highly repressive. At one tragic moment, the strict upbringing led to a terrible incident. On the night of November 8, 2010, Bitch and Han were going about their chores in the house, while Jennifer had just started to go to bed. At some point, they heard the door being opened on the first floor, accompanied by the sounds of screams. It turned out that three unknown men armed with weapons had invaded their home. Demanding all the money in the house and searching the master bedroom, the three men took Bitch and Han to the basement, where they shot them several times. Afterward, the three men took the available cash in the house and left. During this time, Jennifer managed to call the police and informed them that three criminals had broken into the house. She told them that she was tied to the staircase while her parents were taken to the basement. The next day, when the criminals had managed to escape, investigators found that only Bitch had been killed, as Han miraculously survived and was taken to the hospital unconscious, where he remained in a coma for some time. While he lay there, the only testimony available came from Jennifer, as Felix was not at home at that time. According to Jennifer, when the criminals entered, they initially tied her hand to the staircase inside the house and left her there. Her mother and father were taken to the basement accordingly. The police initially believed that the family's wealth had lured the criminals into the house, but they began to treat this theory skeptically, as numerous valuables were not stolen. Moreover, if the criminals came for murder, they would have killed Jennifer as well, but for some reason, they chose not to and left. Jennifer's testimony was very vague and strange, so the police waited for Han to recover and asked him for details. That's when everything changed. Han revealed that he remembered seeing Jennifer whispering friendly and softly to one of the killers. She was not tied up, 
and she walked calmly inside the house alongside the murderers. At this point, the police began to suspect that Jennifer might have been an accomplice, or even the one who organized everything. However, to confirm this, they had to reevaluate all of Jennifer's childhood memories. Her grades in high school were somewhat average, around 70%, except for music. It turned out she had repeatedly forged her report cards using fake templates, deceiving her parents and making them believe she had consistently excellent grades. At one point, she failed a calculus exam in 12th grade, which was crucial for admission to the university of her parents' dreams. Unable to cope with being perceived as a failure, she began lying to everyone she knew, including her parents, pretending that she was attending university. Instead, she spent her time in cafes, teaching piano, and working in a restaurant to earn money. When her parents inquired about the funds, she would claim that she had won a scholarship at university. At that time, Jennifer had a boyfriend named Daniel Kai Kwong Wong, with whom she secretly communicated. He had a mixed Chinese and Filipino heritage, lived in Ajax, and worked at Boston Pizza. Wong, once a student at Mary Ward, transferred to Cardinal Carter Academy in North York, Toronto, due to low grades, and later studied at York University. He was an active trader of harmful substances and managed Boston Pizza. Sometimes Jennifer would stay overnight with this guy, pretending she was at a friend's house. However, Han and Bitch soon became suspicious and began tracking her everywhere. When they saw that she was meeting with the guy and not attending university, the father wanted to kick her out of the house. Still, Bitch convinced him to let her stay. In the end, they prohibited her from communicating with Wong and insisted she finish high school and apply to university. However, Jennifer found a way to communicate with Wong secretly. When Jennifer turned 24, Wong grew tired of trying to maintain a relationship with her. The parents had frightened and restricted Jennifer so much that she lived at home and only met with him secretly. Instead, Wong started dating another young woman. In the spring of 2010, Jennifer and Wong reconnected and devised a plan to hire a professional killer for $10,000 to murder Jennifer's parents, hoping that she would then inherit $500,000. They planned to move in together. Wong connected Jennifer with a man named Lenford Roy Crawford, a Jamaican native whom he referred to as homeboy. Wong gave her a SIM card and an iPhone to contact Crawford without using her regular phone, which was under strict parental control. Crawford then got in touch with another person named Eric Sean Carty, who, in turn, contacted a Montreal native named David Milvagenel. All three were hitmen available for hire. On the day of the murder, Jennifer promised them each $2,000 and before the three men entered the house, Jennifer secretly unlocked the front door to allow them access without alerting her parents. Demanding all the money in the house and searching the master bedroom, the three men took Bitch and Han to the basement, where they shot them multiple times. Bitch was killed, but by mistake, Han survived the wounds. The three men then took all the cash in the house, including the $2,000 from Jennifer, and left. Jennifer's call to the police was an attempt, in her opinion, to divert suspicion away from herself. However, during questioning, a police officer falsely informed Jennifer that he had software capable of analyzing lies and statements and that there were satellites using infrared technology to analyze movements inside buildings. Eventually, Jennifer admitted to hiring the hitman, but claimed she had hired them to kill herself, not her parents. Jennifer's statement led to the arrest of all the hitmen, including her boyfriend Wong. The trial of Jennifer and her accomplices began on March 19, 2014, in Newmarket and lasted for 10 months. Jennifer, Wong, Milvagena, and Crawford were convicted on December 13, 2014 and each received a life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. Jennifer Pan was sentenced to life imprisonment with no chance of parole for 25 years for the murder of her mother and the attempted murder of her father. Her father and brother requested a restraining order, prohibiting her from ever contacting the surviving members of her family again. Despite objections from her lawyers, the judge issued the order. Jennifer is also prohibited from ever contacting Wong again. As of now, Jennifer and Wong are still in prison while the other three accomplices have attempted to transfer to a better facility, but one of them died in their cell. According to the South China Morning Post, this case shocked Canada and the Asian diaspora. An editorial in the Northwest Asian Weekly suggested exploring the idea of recognizing mental and psychological symptoms that child-rearing might have gone too far in the Pan family. Karen Cahoe's story in Toronto Life brought widespread attention to the case, portraying it as an example of how tiger parenting went tragically wrong. In 2016, journalist Jeremy Grimaldi published a true crime book about Jennifer titled A Daughter's Deadly Deception, The Jennifer Pan Story. The story of Jennifer has evoked great sadness among people online, with some even attempting to provide her financial assistance on Reddit while she is in prison. 
However, this case in no way justifies her actions. While she sought to break free from the endless control of her parents, resorting to murder was not a solution to her problems. Instead, it exacerbated them. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the Paradox channel and check out my previous interesting videos. Goodbye, everyone.